I wanted to go ahead and tell you the main point of the scripture even before I read it so that you're very clear and so that you can accurate, re, accurately retell it at the restaurant this afternoon when somebody says, what did the preacher preach on? And that is, this text is about God's kingdom. When I die, if the Lord tarries, I hope to go to heaven, but you need to understand that's, that's not permanent. Revelation 21, 22 described the new Jerusalem that comes down out of heaven from God. And he will be our God and we will be his people and there will be no more suffering, no more tears, no more pain over there. And he says, behold, I make all things new. Now that's permanent. And that's the reason Jesus came in a nutshell is the kingdom of God. Do any of y'all remember the old movie, The Matrix? I know I shouldn't be giving y'all a pop test, but I've got one hand up. Thank you. Well, in The Matrix, everything that was considered real life turns out to be an illusion. And where the people were actually living were in these cocoons and the thought patterns of the persons in the cocoons was producing energy that powered all that was going on. Now, the reason I bring that to your attention is that in some way talks about this world here. Now, it's not that this place is an illusion. Oh, it's real enough. It's just not permanent. I was told by one scholar that if we reduced all of this planet by taking out the energy, what would be left would fit inside one beach ball that when God spoke and created, it was his energy that created what is. And so this is passing away. Not an illusion, but temporary. And Jesus comes today to proclaim not himself. That's not Jesus' message. Jesus' message is to proclaim the kingdom of God. In brief, that's anywhere God is king. We pray in the Lord's Prayer, Thy kingdom come here, now, on earth, in the same way, in the same degree, in like manner, it already is in heaven. The reading is from, Mark, uh, from Matthew chapter 4 and verse 12 following. When Jesus heard that John had been put into prison, he withdrew to Galilee. Now, let's pause there. Evidently, this is for Jesus a sign. He's been baptized, he's been driven in the wilderness, and successfully withstood 40 days and temptations. And now we look at where Jesus fits in the big picture. John the baptizer was the forerunner to proclaim that there's one coming after him. But now back in chapter 3, he has this one-sentence sermon, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. It's not here yet fully, but it's closer now than it's ever been. And so now he's been imprisoned, and evidently that is the sign Jesus has been waiting for. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in... No, I'm sorry. When Jesus heard that John was put into prison, he withdrew to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulon and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a great light has dawned, Isaiah 9, 1 and 2. And by quoting that, Matthew is saying that Jesus is the fulfillment of of all that the Father has promised in Hebrew Scripture. He 
proclaims the great light. Now, he's not the light because he has a message that you need to hear. But the great light is the coming of God's kingdom. It's the nearness of it and those living in darkness. Now, he's gone from his hometown, Nazareth, and he has taken John's place preaching where John was arrested by that same ruler. From that time on, now that's a phrase of transition that means a new beginning. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Now, where have we heard that before? Matthew 3 and verse 2, those are the identical words of John the baptizer. In other words, Jesus is just taking up what has happened before him. And it didn't start with John. It goes all the way back to Genesis to the fall where originally God wanted his kingdom then and there. And it couldn't happen because of the fall. And he's been working for that kingdom ever since. And Jesus is just the last, the fulfillment. And that kingdom is near. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers. Now, by the way, this sea is also called Tiberias and uh, Gennesaret. And so don't believe you're the only area that's got the same body of water called two different names, just depending on when it was called that. I got used to calling that body the Kentucky Lake, living up in Kentucky. Now down here they call it something different, you know. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left their boat. Now, pause there. In both cases, both sets of brothers are called by Jesus, and what do they do? They leave immediately. It's almost like we're back at Elijah throwing his mantle over Elisha and having Elisha become the disciple. And what does Elisha do? He uh, breaks up the plow he's been plowing with. He kills the oxen, has a barbecue for the family. You're talking about not going back, you know, you done eating what you were using to farm with. They have a, a, a Christian contemporary song out now. It talks about burn the boats. Well, this is not going back either. And you leave the old life and you don't become a better person. You become born all over again from above. They left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went throughout Galilee teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. And this then is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Father, may the word of my mouth, the thought, the meditation, the heart of all here today be acceptable or in the name of Jesus become acceptable. You alone are our strength, our re redeemer. Amen. We have here a message about God's coming kingdom that the fulfillment of it is in Jesus Christ. And he doesn't come proclaiming his, himself. He, procl he proclaims the coming of the kingdom. And that is the essence of the message. But it didn't start with him. He just repeats what John says. And it traces all the way back from the beginning. There's continuity. And what happens as Jesus begins to preach. The first thing he does as he begins to preach, he works on finding his own replacements. Uh, we in the modern church have lost that. From the very beginning, Jesus finds and starts to equip his own replacements. Now, the old saying in the church is, God doesn't call the equipped, he equips the called. And you see that in these two sets of brothers because he doesn't call seminary graduates. He calls fishermen. He'll call a tax collector. He'll use anybody. God calls the common because who else can reach out to the common people? And so he calls 
And in doing so, he points the pattern you and I need to follow. From the very beginning, the message of the gospel is, you know, it's, it's proclaimed, but it's also working on your own replacement. If you take a set of fiancés, a husband and a wife-to-be, and let them get married and don't do anything to prohibit, and they're both healthy, within a year or so, you probably will have a baby. Uh, Jesus is the groom, and the church is the bride, and you look around and say, where are the babies? We haven't been training our replacements. We haven't been proclaiming God's kingdom. And then if we do, we're sort of shy about saying, now, come on, you need to come along and, and take part in it. I knew a, a young woman one time. She, she worked the cash register at uh, Walmart. I know that's not your favorite place, you know, the, the line, the checkout line at Walmart. But she was brilliant at it. You would ask her, what do you do for a living? She'd say, I am an evangelist for the Lord Jesus Christ, cleverly disguised as the checkout girl at Walmart. I mean, she had her hand around what it is that our calling is to be. When, when, when Jesus said to fishermen, come, follow me, I'll teach you to fish for people. It's not that all of us are supposed to be fishermen. The point is, whatever you do, do it for God's sake. In an all new life, you're born again. You're not just improved. You're not just better. You're new. And that means what you do is new. And you used to do it for your own sake. Now do it for God's sake. We, uh, we have this fantastic passage here. It's way too deep to fully understand in one sitting. But you understand that what Jesus is doing here is he's laying out the message the church is supposed to be proclaiming even to this moment. We continue what's been started before us. We don't try to come up with a new message. We just keep that same gospel that's been proclaimed for centuries. And we go and proclaim it. And as we proclaim it, we train our own replacements. And the kingdom of God has come near. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen.